we're in a series at the moment on the Holy Spirit, and it's my privilege to speak today on how the Holy Spirit helps you. We all need help. Maybe you're going through a real challenge in life at the moment. Uh, maybe you're facing a real opportunity at work, or in a relationship, or in another situation. Like, I just need wisdom about how to navigate this opportunity well. What does it mean that we have the Holy Spirit with us, for us, besides us, as we go through life? How might he make the difference and transform the challenges we face that might, in our eyes, be insurmountable or be impossible, but through them, God might even use them to work something powerful in our lives and in the lives of those around us in our community and our city. I don't think we'll ever know the potential that we have to transform our families, our workplaces, our schools, our universities, our hospitals, our businesses, without the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I don't think we'll ever really know what true courage and true faith looks like without the Holy Spirit in our lives. I don't think we as a church will ever know the difference we could make to the city and beyond without the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst us. And that's why I'm so excited about this passage. And the first thing we see in this passage is that the Holy Spirit is your advocate. In this passage, as you know, Jesus is with his disciples. He's in the upper room before he's going to be arrested. He's going to be taken to the cross. He's going to be executed. And he gathers his closest friends for a meal to communicate with them, to spend time with them, and to impart to them key information and key wisdom that they're going to need as they move on through their lives. He says they're going to be excluded from the synagogues. They're going to be ostracized. They're People who try and kill them will think they're doing God a favor. They're going to face stress and trouble and attack and confusion and grief. He says they'll be filled with grief. And you think, why is Jesus saying all these things? And he says, I've told you this so that when the time comes, you may remember that I warned you about them. It's not so Jesus can say, I told you so. (laughs) Should have been listening to me when you're upstairs. Not so Jesus can say, I'm actually quite good at predicting the future and I've proved it now. It's not for that reason. He wants them to feel completely prepared. Completely prepared and utterly secure. So when these challenges come, they won't feel thrown, they won't feel unnerved because they won't be surprised. But much more importantly, they'll know that Jesus himself is not surprised. He isn't taken by surprise by what they are going to face. And he tells them all this so they will not fall away. Whatever you face today, it might be an exciting opportunity, it might be a great challenge. Jesus is not surprised by what you're facing. And he doesn't want you to fall away. And Jesus says, the reason you're not going to fall away is because you're not on your own. He says, unless I go away, the advocate will not come. But when the advocate comes, the Father and the Son, they send the Holy Spirit to be with them and to be with us. See, here Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the advocate, the paraclete, the advocate, the one who's called alongside to speak. It's actually the same word Uh, which was used at this time for defense lawyer or or for a barrister. An advocate who comes alongside you at your hour of need and guides you and advises you and gives you wisdom, helps you to navigate life, speaks on your behalf and speaks to you to encourage you. It's a fascinating name to give the Holy Spirit. Of all the words that have ever been written or spoken, all the names that have ever been uttered in every language, Jesus chooses a name for the Holy Spirit, which means advocate. I find that fascinating. I spent uh, many years uh, working as an advocate, actually. That's what I did for a living uh, back in the day. And so I wore a silly gown. Here we are. Here it is. Dragged out of retirement. Um, A silly gown. There it is. You wear this silly gown just to prove that you're an advocate. When I started, I I was 22 and I looked about 15. So this was quite helpful. And um, you wear a silly little gown and a silly little wig, which I wouldn't put on. And um, (laughs) and, and uh, 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 very quickly, very quickly, a little wig like that. (laughs) And... um, 
and you come alongside and you represent people often at the most difficult and testing moment of their lives. Sometimes they're very experienced, much more experienced in the criminal justice system than the people that are actually representing them. Sometimes it's their first time in court in their entire lives. And the best advocates have this remarkable combination of sensitivity and toughness. They need to understand the people they're representing. So they need empathy, but they also need to be robust. They need to be strong enough to represent them. They're not there just to cheer them up and make them feel a bit better about life. No advocate in the history of the world has ever said to their client, there, there, it's not so bad. <laughs> Never happens. No, client has ever, no advocate has ever said to their client, look, look on the bright side, it's a sunny day. <laughs> Go for a walk in the park. It doesn't matter that you lost. No, client, no advocate has ever said to their client, you know, I'm really sorry you're convicted and you're in prison, but look at the bright side. You have lots of time to earn a new skill. It never <laughs> happens. No, an advocate feels every rise and fall in the case, every up and they're down. They're so for you that it feels like they are in the trenches with you, and yet they're not just a mate. Their authority, their skill, their expertise, their role, their purpose sets them apart. Their first duty is to the court, to justice, and their second duty is to you, to your best interest, even if that might be not what you think your best interest is. So your advocate will tell you some things you don't want to know and you don't want to hear. They will challenge you. They'll probe your excuses, but they will also fight to the very end for you and for your best interests. And that's the image, that's the actual name Jesus uses here, for the Holy Spirit. I represented uh, lots of different people over the years. And some of them were very famous people, some of them were very powerful people, some of them were very wealthy people, but some of them uh, stuck with me for very different reasons. Uh, one person I represented, they, they were very, very poor, and they had had a very, very difficult life. And... Um, she was a single mum and was doing her best to raise her two kids on her own in difficult circumstances. And she made a mistake. And people make mistakes in life. And she held on to some money that she shouldn't have held on to. And, um, and it was quite a lot of money, serious offence. And uh, she pleaded guilty. She had to plead guilty, accepted her responsibility at the first opportunity. And because it was a serious offence and because of the amount of money involved, uh, she, all, the, all the authorities said she should go to prison. And so I had to turn up at court and try and persuade the judge not to send her to prison. And it would have been terrible for her, given all the difficulties in her life, to go into prison. But it would have been catastrophic for her children. And this case kind of gripped me. And I just, for weeks, it was all I could think about. It was like the smallest case I was doing at that time. It was only going to take, you know, half an hour in court max. But I was just so focused on it. I read everything I could possibly read. We got all the reports we could possibly get. You know, I rewrote my speech about 10 times. I remember turning up to court with my, you know, my silly wig on. And I was thinking, I'm not sitting down until the judge says he's not going to send us to prison. This could get really awkward. I feel so passionate about this. And I kind of stood up and I used all the arguments I could think. I kept speaking. I kept thinking of everything else. I was throwing everything in. All I could hear was my client sobbing in the dock. I, like, you know, I didn't know what to do. And then there came a moment in the, ca in, in the hearing where the judge just put up his hand normally a sign to stop and, um, and so I stopped and he, he kind of leaned back in his chair and he looked at the ceiling of the court looked at my client looked at me and he said Mr. Foster I'm, I'm not going to send your client to prison and in that moment I tell you I could have took my wig off and thrown it up in the air <laughs> but, but, but we don't do that so thank you your honour and I sat down very quietly now <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a far better advocate than I ever will be or was. The Holy Spirit is far more committed to you than I ever was to any client. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. That's the actual name Jesus used. Jesus, who is with the Father and the Spirit since before all time, and the name he uses to describe the Holy Spirit is the advocate of all the names that ever was and will be, the advocate. The Holy Spirit is gentle, but he's not soft. The Holy Spirit is kind, but he's not weak. The Holy Spirit is utterly distinct. He's the Holy Spirit. And yet he will come alongside you in your hour of need. When you face challenges, 
When you're out of your depth and you don't know who to call, you have a strong helper. You have one called alongside you to help you, to represent you. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. And that changes things. Holy Spirit, he's not just about fuzzy feelings for 10 minutes on a Sunday that might get you through the week. He is a powerful and dynamic presence of a person in your life. Your everyday life with a role and a calling to represent represent you and to represent God through you. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. But the second thing we see here is that the Holy Spirit wants you to find truth. Jesus says when the advocate comes, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is to come. John 14 says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Holy Spirit wants you to find truth. We've become a little bit blasé about truth in our culture. Uh, This is a city which is basically founded in the pursuit of truth and the idea that the Lord, through his light, might reveal truth to people. But in our culture, truth is a strange thing at the moment. You know, lots of people say we live in a post-truth age. Truth doesn't matter anymore. We're freed up from the imposition of truth. And it feels very liberalizing. It feels almost like permissive. And it, oh, it's so freeing for people that we don't have to worry about there being a truth or the truth anymore. But it's not the case. Even in our interpersonal relationships, we don't actually quite like the idea that there's not truth. I, I, um, I've got a confession to make, which is that I don't watch Love Island, just so you're clear about that. And um, uh, I'm not judging you if you do watch it. Uh, that's not my responsibility. It's the Holy Spirit's. No. Um, the, but lots of people... A significant number of people, 18, 25, are watching this program. And it's what I find fascinating, having read the reports about it, is that it's not how people behave to each other that really upsets people. So, you know, the fact that X was with Y and then they do something with Z or whatever. Um, It's that they might lie about it. And what really causes the massive blow-ups, which make for, in some people's eyes, great television, is when people don't tell the truth. And then the producers can expose when that person tells a lie. We really care about whether we're being told the truth or not. Because actually, it's not true that if you don't have truth, you have more freedom. It's the opposite. Because when you know the truth, you have the freedom to act on the world as it actually is. You can relate to people as they actually perceive to be. When you don't have truth, when people are lying to you, you are deprived the freedom of interacting with your reality in the way it actually is. So it doesn't make you more free, it makes you less free. And in our society, you know, people say, oh yeah, post-truth is great. People can just do what they want. They can live their lives. We don't have to worry about truth. Politicians glibly tell lies. It's fine. No one even notices it anymore. But then sometimes it cuts through. Lies can start snowballs which lead to the fall of governments. And in some ways, that's a good thing because if truth and lies don't matter, then quite quickly you're on a path towards totalitarianism because if there's no truth, there's nothing to stand against the naked use of power to serve people's interests. Truth matters and the Holy Spirit wants us to guide us, to strengthen us, to help us to find truth. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all the truth, teach you all things. It's committed to you helping to find the truth. And you can trust the Holy Spirit if you ask him to lead you into all truth. How does he do that? Well, the primary way is through God's word. We know that all scripture is God breathed. Another way of putting that is all scripture is breathed to life by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit inspired the scriptures to be written and then takes them and applies them to our hearts. He cares deeply about God's word because he was involved in its creation. He's not uninterested in it, not moved beyond it, not fed up with it, not rejecting it, not circumventing it. The spirit cares about the word he breathed into life. He cares about it being amplified, cares about it being heard, cares about it being truth, and he wants to help you build your life on this word. 
And sometimes you sense that. Sometimes you read kind of a verse and it's like a, a phrase pops out at you or a word pops out at you or something pops out at you. It resonates with the situation you're facing in your life that day. It's the most encouraging thing in the world. Sometimes it feels like you're reading it. It's like you're on your own. It feels just like another book. It's really tough. I've had days like that. I think, why am I doing this? But you never read scripture alone. The Holy Spirit is always with you, helping you. The Holy Spirit, who inspired the words of Scripture to be written, wants them to set your life on fire. This isn't just paper and ink and type and letters and words. This is truth on fire. This has the potential to transform lives, shift destinies, and transform cities and nations. And the Word comes to us through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes to us through the Word. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit will remind you of what I've said. So if you want God to speak to you more, read the Bible more. If you want the Holy Spirit to speak to you more, read the Bible more. Then he can only remind you of what you've read. So the more you read, the more he can remind you. The more he can bring verses and stories and things from his word to mind and help you as you live your life. And so what I found is, you know, as you're reading the Bible, you kind of, you know, you kind of, you know, the Holy Spirit is kind of, you know, helping you and applying it to your heart and applying it to your heart. But then it kind of goes beyond that as well, because the Holy Spirit wants you to find truth in everything you're doing. He wants you to understand, you know, what's the right path to take, help lead you around. Oh, it's all getting a bit flashy here. And, um, you know, help you kind of, Order your paths, order your steps, help you find the right way forward, help you find God's purposes for your life. He wants you to get your priorities in order. He wants to help you with what is true about what really matters in life. So many messages out there. Every single day we consume hundreds of them about what really matters. But the Holy Spirit wants to say, well, no, these are the things that really matter. Not that bit of the wall there. But these are the things that really matter. might be the Holy Spirit just kind of puts, as you're praying, someone on your heart. So there's someone over there. might put someone in heart. Like, I should reach out to that person. I should help them. I should maybe call them, phone them. Sorry for getting blinded in the corner. And um, it might be that the Holy Spirit just puts it at home. Just don't want you to miss out there. So. And, um, you know, put someone in your heart. And then you can reach out to them. You can move towards them. You can encourage them. might, might put a, an idea into your head. A creative idea about something you want to try in the workplace. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, the Holy Spirit convicts us about sin and righteousness and judgment, convicts the Lord. Sometimes you, know, you might be watching something, you might feel like, I need to turn this off. It's like your heart is checked by what you're watching. So it's not good for my eyes to be on that stuff. Sometimes you can be in a relationship and you feel the Holy Spirit check you about the way you've acted in that relationship. Sometimes you might have a conversation with a colleague, you might feel actually... I I didn't speak well in that situation. I need to go back and say, sorry, the Holy Spirit wants to lead you in all truth so you can see the world as it is, so you can see yourself as you truly are in God's eyes and so you know how to live a life that will bring glory to him. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. And then the third thing we see in this passage is that the Holy Spirit will speak about Jesus. Jesus says, when the advocate comes, he will testify about me. He says, he will glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify me, Jesus, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Holy Spirit will always testify about Jesus, bear witness to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the advocate who comes alongside you to speak for you, to speak through you. And I wonder what language you think the Holy Spirit speaks. It's not a test. Aramaic, Arabic, Hebrew, Yoruba, Kosa, Mandarin. Yes, all of those. Holy Spirit speaks all those languages, don't worry. But his primary language is Jesus. The Holy Spirit's speech bears witness, testifies to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit loves to speak to your heart about Jesus. You can invite him to do that. Next time you're going through a difficult situation or you just need a moment at work or, or if the toddlers are playing up and you're trying to navigate the complexity or when you're trying to work out the right call to make. Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? 
says things like, you know, you have a wonderful saviour, Jesus. Do you see how you precious you are to God? You're an inestimable value that he might send Jesus for you. You know, through Jesus, you have an extraordinary inheritance. Do you know, do you know Jesus has taken hold of you, and what he takes hold of, he's not going to let go of. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says, just remember, Jesus rules and reigns in this universe, even when things are painful or confusing. Sometimes it's like he nudges and says, Look, when you feel lost, Jesus has not lost sight of you. You're not beyond his gaze. Sometimes when the enemy comes at you and, and kind of attacks your heart and your mind with lies, the Holy Spirit comes and says, no, 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 no. You're a child of God. You're much loved. You're bought at a price. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. The Spirit testifies about Jesus. It says, look at Jesus. Look how beautiful he is. Look how worthy he is. Look how faithful he is. Look how loving he is. Look how, though he was with the Father from before all time, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself and took the form even of a servant. And was obedient even to death, even death on a cross. And so the Father raised him up and gave him a name which is above every name. The Holy Spirit loves to speak about Jesus. But he also wants to testify through you. He wants to nudge you and move you into positions where you can bear witness to Jesus. What the Holy Spirit loves to do. To testify to who Jesus is. Never forget being in church one day and um, a guy came forward for prayer ministry and we prayed for him and uh, he said that was a really confusing experience. And I said, what do you mean? He said, the person who's praying for me, they had this kind of word for me and he explained exactly what I'm facing in my workplace at the moment. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he said, what is that? And I said, well, you know, there are these like spiritual gifts and one of them is prophecy. And, and, and I said, this is interesting. And I said, how long have you been coming to church and he said 15 minutes <laughs> I said what he said well I'm an Uber driver I dropped someone off it and I heard the music so I thought I'd walk in and then I just listened to the talk and I thought I'll respond he said this is crazy <laughs> been in church 15 minutes someone prayed for him came to faith joined a small group came that Tuesday that's fun it's fun when the Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus through you. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing people encountering Jesus on a weekly basis. Friends of yours, colleagues of yours, people you're inviting. Also just people coming in. Two people last Sunday who just decided they wanted to start following Jesus. In your workplaces, Jesus is position, the Holy Spirit is positioning you to bear witness to Jesus. In your homes, in your communities, that you might speak of him. And I find it really exciting. And it's not just one category of person. It's not just with families or 20s or, or 30s or students or this kind of person or that kind of person. It's across the board. You know, we've got an amazing community in our church of people who are uh, either in recovery from addiction or you know, have, have left prison and are rebuilding their lives. And I love that we have that as a growing community within our church. And one of our groups on Alpha this term had, had a number of people like that who, who just need a bit of extra support in life. And I want to tell you, I've done 26 Alpha courses at least. And um, I'd never seen anything quite like what was happening in this group. Because on the first week it was 8, then the second week it was 10, then it was 12, then it was 14, then it was 16. They were still bringing friends on the 8th week and the ninth week. And technically you're not allowed to bring people after the 3rd week. So I mean, they kept coming up to me and saying, can we bring some more people? I didn't want to say no, but it was like awkward. I was like, you know, what do I do? And this group was just growing and growing and growing. Really interesting people. They're friends. People who they've met in a previous life. Who they were saying, come to church with me. One of them came up to me just as I was about to speak on how to overcome evil, which is the second to last talk we do. And he said, um, what are you speaking about tonight, Steve? And I said, I'm speaking about how you overcome evil. He said, I can tell you something about evil. I was like, oh, okay. And um, he said, I can tell you lots about evil. What do you want to know? And uh, I was like, well, I, you know, I was literally just about to start speaking. I said, well, tell me one thing. He, he thought for a while and he said, if you're going to tell them one thing, about how to resist evil in your life, it would be this. You ready? I said, I'm ready. He said, don't take crack cocaine. <laughs> so 
So I was like, okay, thanks. He's like, yeah, yeah. He said, the other drugs, they're all terrible, but crack cocaine, that's another level. He said, when I took crack cocaine, it was like I inhaled the devil into me. He said, it was awful. He said, the only thing that set me free was Jesus Christ. He said, I've never been the same since Jesus Christ set me free from crack cocaine. So I learned something that night. You're learning something at church. Don't say it's not useful, you know. This week, if you're tempted, don't take crack cocaine. But I, it's a little bit like what the Holy Spirit does. Because this person had invited multiple people to his alpha group. People he knew from all different walks of life. He was bearing witness to Jesus. But then also, as he talked about what Jesus had done in his life, he was glorifying Jesus. He was saying, I wouldn't be here but for what Jesus has done in my life. And I know that's happening in so many different contexts at the moment. People just saying very simply, this is what Jesus has done in my life. And I want to bring him glory and praise. Jesus says, he will testify about me. He will testify about Jesus and he will glorify me. He will glorify Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Why did the Holy Spirit come? To testify about Jesus and to glorify about Jesus. Holy Spirit could have been sent for any purpose. But two of the primary purposes are to speak about Jesus and to glorify Jesus. When we speak about Jesus, when we worship him, we're close to the very heart of God. When the Holy Spirit is on the move, people talk about Jesus more. When the Holy Spirit is on the move, Jesus is exalted. And we, I love that we have ice cream. I love that we have parties. But we're not just a community club. I love that we're passionate about discipleship and theology. You know, I'm hoping we'll start a school of theology in September to help people go deeper in their faith. But we're not just an inward-looking church. We are a movement instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and led by the Holy Spirit. We exist to bear witness to Jesus and to glorify him. A movement which is not going to stop until it has drawn thousands, millions of people into his family. And he is stirring something in our church, in our lives, which I think is going to shift things in our workplaces, in our communities, in our city. He's heard the prayers sown into this place for decades. He's seen the tears that have been wept for the least, the last, and the lost. And he has not left himself without a witness, without an advocate. The Holy Spirit is your advocate. The Holy Spirit will lead you on the right path and he will bear witness to Jesus and glorify his name. In Jesus' name, amen.